Hello, welcome to the course on polymers. Uh, and uh, in these uh, weeks, we are discussing polymer processing and recycling techniques. And you can see that we are spending significant amount of time discussing various aspects of uh, polymer processing recycling techniques. Uh, but in all of these discussions, uh, the macromolecular nature, the entanglement, the segments, the relaxation processes, all of them form a very important component of our understanding how do we process these polymers. So in this particular lecture, we will continue our discussion and try to relate rheology and processing uh, by keeping uh, a viewpoint of how it is useful in terms of applications. And we will do this by first uh, looking at uh, the uh, what happens uh, in terms of different types of flows that we have discussed and uh, how is mixing uh, done in case of polymers and how shear flow or extensional flow can be connected to what is the level of mixing that is happening in the polymers. A very practical application uh, in terms of uh, polymer processing is related to die swell or extrudate swell where the shape that is extruded out is related to the die but it is not the same as what is the die opening. So how do we relate these to each other? And uh, what we will see is one of the nonlinear viscoelastic measure which is extremely important in terms of uh, characterizing the polymer melt itself is normal stress difference. So viscosity and uh, uh, G prime, G double prime which are small deformation properties uh, that we have discussed so far are no longer sufficient to characterize a polymer melt and explain phenomena like die swell. And uh, this will also highlight the fact that how a one dimensional picture is not at all sufficient when we are trying to discuss rheology and processing of polymeric systems. So let us first look at mixing in different flows. Uh, one of the things we have to uh, realize is the fact that uh, polymeric materials are largely mixed in laminar flow condition. Whenever we mix low viscosity fluids, uh, we achieve turbulence when all these eddies form and re-break and mixing is easily achieved. Of course, when eddies are very small, in the end uh, molecular mixing does uh, become important. But in case of uh, polymers, because we have laminar flow, uh, the mixing is always dependent on the type of flow which is there. And in terms of laminar flow, we could either do a shear flow or uh, we could do an extensional flow. And in fact, mixing is very different in these two cases. And the reason for that is as follows, that if you take, uh, let us say, a simple shear flow and if, like, let us say, I look at two points and see how they are separated in time. So if, uh, if you recall, this is moving slightly higher velocity than this. So basically, there is a relative velocity between them and the flow rate uh, is uh, kept constant because this top plate velocity has a constant velocity. So, but the relative displacement keeps on increasing as a function of time. So the two material points if we take, they are separating with respect to each other linearly in time, which means the distance between them increases linearly with time. If I look at 10 seconds, there is some distance. If I look at 20 seconds, the distance would have doubled. That is what we mean by a linear increase. It is some proportional increase, if not double, triple, but it keeps on increasing by the same factor and therefore it increases linear with time. But if we take a look at uh, the extensional flow, in which case we stretch the material and therefore uh, material flows in this direction but it contracts from the other direction. And uh, so in this case, the separation is in fact exponential in time because in these kind of flows, the Vx is proportional to some strain rate constant and then position of the material. So if we know that velocity is nothing but del x by del t, then it is proportional to x. And so what you can get is dx by dx is some constant uh, times dt. So you can see that it is an exponential. So the position of material particles as a function of time changes exponentially and therefore two material points which are separated uh, at a some distance, their distance changes exponentially, which means it increases rapidly. And so in terms of mixing, this is very useful. And uh, so we can see that uh, in terms of using if uh, mixing laminar regime, we need to have as much as possible extensional mixing. And this is what is shown in the graph here, where if you look at the specific energy, because energy which is required for achieving a certain degree of mixing in the material, uh, 
uh, we can measure the mixing by saying that you know if let us say I have some material uh, and in which I draw a hypothetical uh, circle and now what happens to this shape of this circle as the material is getting deformed. The more uh, this uh, circle gets deformed the more there is a chance of uh, uh, one fluid layer contacting another fluid layer. So, therefore, area after deformation and area before deformation of this hypothetical sphere can give me an idea of what is the amount of mixing that can happen. And what you can see is in simple shear flow the energy required is much more because particles which are close to each other do not really get separated, they are only separating linearly in time. But extensional flows can require much less amount of energy but this area under deformation increases quite rapidly. So, therefore, extensional mixing is always better and this is achieved sometimes in uh, by choosing an appropriate processing technique. So, for example, when we use uh, roll mills or when we use uh, uh, the twin screw extruders, so we achieve some of these features so that mixing is enhanced. The other feature that we ought to remember about uh, the overall importance of viscosity being very high, not only do we get laminar flow, but we also get very high in terms of viscous dissipation. Because viscous dissipation is just related to stress into strain rate. So, the consequence of uh, viscosity being very high is also we get lot of viscous dissipation and heat transfer is always important in case of polymer processing operations. So, we can see how rheology has a very important role to play practically in terms of deciding conditions for polymer processing, mixing, in terms of heat transfer during processing. Now, let us uh, uh, look at one uh, last aspect related to importance of rheology uh, which is based on uh, the extruded swell. So, the fact that uh, if we have uh, a die opening which is let us say circular, if the material comes out of this die its shape will be not at all circular. So, it is going to be much more complicated. So, if I want a fiber where the circular uh, cross section is desired, then uh, I will have to design a die which has a different shape. So, we need to understand what is the extruded shape compared to the die shape itself. However, there is another important phenomenon which is regardless of the shape itself the size which we get. The size of the die, so the nominal diameter of the die and the nominal diameter of the extruded swell. And this is something uh, when we open a tap of water and uh, so if we have a tap of water and uh, if we open uh, it then uh, what happens is water falls out and uh, generally the jet diameter is uh, same order of magnitude or smaller than the capillary the diameter of the tap. But in case of non-Newtonian fluids, if we have uh, this kind of a die opening from which the polymer melt is coming out, generally the diameter of the polymer melt is much more than the capillary or the die diameter and that is why we call it a swell. So, the size of the extruded itself is much more different than whatever is the opening through which the polymer is coming out. And uh, the reason for this is again uh, related to same things that we have been blaming polymer behavior on and that is stretching and orientation of the segments of macromolecules. So, given that we have uh, these uh, macromolecules uh, coil like shapes and now we are forcing them to get sheared what happens is the macromolecule segments get stretched and oh, they start orienting. And uh, so, in, in this part of the capillary or this part of the die where we are forcing the polymer molecule, what you will see is the macromolecules are more uh, oriented towards the flow direction. They are of course, still entangled, but on an average they are getting oriented. But as soon as they come out, and uh, if you look at now the extruded swell this region, what happens is they would like to go back. So, there is always a recovery and this is related to the fact that uh, macromolecular conformation would like to be maximum and so there is a recovery 
related to uh, the macromolecular coil uh, shapes and so there is this swell. What you can also see is uh, largely we are imposing shear stress on the material in this capillary. So, this is something where it is mostly shear. So, even though we are forcing material in a pipe uh, or a die uh, and largely using shear uh, forces, the material feels normal forces because it is getting stretched and there is a tendency for this stretch to recoil or recover. So, the material develops what is called a normal stress in the material. And uh, this is very uh, important uh, discovery uh, uh, during the development of rheology as a field and uh, people trying to understand polymer processing much better that the diameter of the extrudate or the diameter of the extrudate when let us say it is just a Newtonian fluid is related to each other through a coefficient which is related to normal stress difference in the material. So, N 1 is called the normal stress difference. And since there is a subscript 1, uh, this is called the first normal stress difference. So, that implies that there are two normal stress differences and I will explain that uh, in a uh, couple of minutes. And then also there is the shear stress at the wall. So, this kind of a correlation is extremely useful for engineers. So, if I want to understand how much is the dye swell in the material and if I look at you know if I have two melts with different viscosity, there is no way I can explain why the two have different dye swell. It could also be that two materials have different viscosity, but they have exactly the same dye swell. So, what is determining the dye swell property? The dye swell property is depending on the stretching and recovery and recovery and stretching are related to the elasticity of the material and elasticity is also associated with this normal stress difference. So, therefore, the ratio of the normal stress difference to what is the shear stress in the material determines how much will be the dye swell. And so, this kind of a correlation then tells us that we must understand normal stress differences at a fundamental level because they are part of very practical correlations. And so, the reason of entanglement, reptation, the overall structure that we have discussed so many times for the polymeric systems are very important in terms of determining their rheological response in terms of normal stress differences and these normal stress differences have immediate implications for practical usage where we can understand dice well by characterizing normal stress differences in the materials. So, therefore, if we our objective is to get control dimensions of the extrudate, we must understand normal stress differences in the material. Over and above this, if there are various interfacial properties, interfacial tension, surface tension, which determine several other key features of uh, polymeric melt behavior. For example, if our objective is to produce a nice smooth uh, cylindrical object like this, if there is lot of undulations on the surface, then it is a failed part, failed processing operation. So, things like shark skin effect uh, or melt fracture, which will actually completely damage the overall surface of the extrudate material are not desirable at all. And so, rheology and interfacial properties both have to be understood if these advanced uh, failure phenomena during polymer processing have to be understood. So, for our course, uh, we are not going to go into details of these, but we should uh, remember that uh, many of the things we have discussed in terms of rheology and processing, we have discussed those set of rheological properties which can tell us information about what flow rate to use, what may be the pressure drop, what is the effective viscosity, what is the overall dissipation rate and these kind of features uh, related to polymer processing. However, there are several other features which have to be understood before we become successful polymer processing people. So, let us uh, continue and understand uh, very briefly what is uh, normal stress difference. Uh, we will do this by looking at uh, simple shear flow, uh, which is again nothing but uh, just uh, taking fluid between two parallel plates and making them move. One of the plates is moving with some velocity v and therefore, the overall fluid moves. And this is uh, with this coordinate system x and y, we say that velocity is there in x direction, it is only a function of y. And uh, in due to this uh, velocity, there is basically only one component of velocity gradient and this we call the shear rate. 
If you look at the overall strain rate tensor, it has only two components which is directly related to shear rate. But notice that so many components are zero. So normal components are zero and also components which are related to z and uh, xz, yz, they are all zero. Now for this kind of a situation, if you look at what happens to stress, uh, stress also only those components are non-zero wherever strain rate is non-zero. So therefore, uh, tau yx or sigma yx. Sigma is the total stress, tau is the deviatoric stress. So generally what we see is only tau yx is non-zero and therefore sigma yx is non-zero, but sigma xx and sigma yy are nothing but minus p. So in this situation, if I look at what happens to normal stresses, so if I look at the total stress tensor, normal stresses are all equal to minus p. They are identical and they are equal to minus p. If I look at the deviatoric stress tensor, normal stresses are all zero. So normal stress difference is zero in case of a Newtonian fluid when we are imposing shear flow on it. What that implies is also that if I have this simple shear flow and uh, because I am moving the top plate with a certain velocity, I have to apply a certain force on it. And uh, so the, uh, I need to apply a force to make this velocity possible. And that is all that is required for the velocity to be kept constant for a Newtonian fluid. In fact, same feature is also observed for shear thinning fluids. Uh, in case of shear thinning fluids also, what you can see is generalized Newtonian fluids, only the yx component is non-zero. And so therefore, for both uh, linear viscous fluids and non-linear viscous fluids or Newtonian fluid and generalized Newtonian fluid, normal stress differences are zero. But let us look at the situation for a viscoelastic fluid. In case of a viscoelastic fluid, what happens is even tau xx, tau yy and tau zz are non-zero even though we are only imposing shear flow. And uh, practically what that implies is if I take a viscoelastic fluid between two parallel plates and like earlier, I impose a certain velocity of the top plate so that fluid starts moving, I have to apply a force so that this plate motion is possible. But in addition to this force, I also need to apply a normal force on the material. Can you think of where does this normal force come from? Why is there a tendency of this fluid to throw the plates away even though I am only trying to move the plate horizontally? So if we let us say just choose a coordinate system and I will state it again. So the plate is being moved only in x direction, but the polymeric material seems to deform and make the plate move in the y direction. And that is why to keep the gap the same, I will have to apply a normal force and ensure that the gap is the same so that the strain rate which is nothing but V by H remains constant for this particular experiment which is a simple shear flow at a constant strain rate. So therefore, uh, this is a very practical implication that you know even though the motion is largely in x direction, the material generates stresses which are not just shear stresses, but normal stresses and these normal stresses lead to this normal force N. So if I can do rheology like earlier where I rotate and therefore a torque is required to rotate this material and shear between two plates or cone and plate, if I can measure the normal force which is this material generates, then I can have a measure of the normal stresses in the material. And again you can think uh, what is happening at a macromolecular scale because uh, the uh, at equilibrium uh, macromolecules are coil like, but because we start shearing them, what happens is they start getting stretched. And because they got, got stretched, there is a tendency for them to recover and that is what leads to the normal stress differences. So deviatoric stress also therefore will have the normal stresses and we can define the two normal stresses based on whatever are the flow direction and direction of shear. So in this example, x is the direction of flow and y is the direction of shear. y is the direction in which there is velocity gradient.
So, in the example of a simple shear flow discussed here, n 1 will be tau x x minus tau y y and n 2 will be tau y y minus tau z z or sigma y y minus sigma z z and sigma x x minus sigma y y. So, this n 1 is what is related to dice swell in the material. So, I can do this very useful experiment. I do simple shear just the way I did for measurement of viscosity, but in addition to focusing only on the force which is related to shear stress, I also focus on the normal force which is related to normal stress difference, measure it and then I know how to predict dice well for a given polymeric material. So, with this uh, one of the features that you can see that once to understand rheology three dimensional picture is always required. Now, we will close this lecture by just pointing out that lot of things we have discussed so far are related to rotational rheology, where we take material between different uh, plates and or cone and plate or different con concentric cylinders and then achieve a quiet flow. However, we can also do tube flow where uh, we do apply pressure and there is a pressure drop and flow rate measurement which can again give us idea of the viscosity of the material and capillary rheometers are extremely common in terms of polymer processing operations. On the other hand to understand viscosity for dilute solutions, polymer solvent systems, to understand solution behavior, we use YouTube viscometers and Obelon viscometers where viscosity is slightly modified compared to solvent and therefore, these are low viscosity systems. Given that we have seen how important extensional flow is for polymer processing operation, there are a fair number of extensional rheometers which have come into being in the last 15, 20 years. Initially uh, in 80s and 90s, this was a very difficult set of experiments to do. Now, they have become more easy and uh, many commercial uh, rotational rheometers also offer these days extensional attachments. Again, three dimensional picture is must to understand the extensional versus shear rheometry of polymeric systems. And of course, we have also seen that to complement these and to get some quick numbers, we have uh, the Mooney rheometers and the oscillating disc rheometers and melt flow indexers which are very useful tools for practitioners to generate some numbers to make some quick design decisions. So, with this uh, we will close this lecture and uh, if you are interested in uh, knowing little more about normal stress differences and how to understand them uh, for uh, not just polymeric systems, but for filled polymer systems and for colloidal systems, you can look at uh, these lectures. Thank you.